to the Introduction to Healthcare Information Technology for School of Continuing Education. Uh, this course is the first course, or the first primary course, for the healthcare certification. What we're going to be doing in this module is we're going to be examining just the an, an overview of health information technology, the industry, as well, and ask some questions that will prepare us for the rest of the course. The course will be divided into eight modules, which will cover a variety of systems and provide an overview of the health information technology field that will lead into the other courses that you will take for the certificate program. So the questions that we have are why study health information technology? And the reason is very simple. There is a lot of demand now for health information technologists, especially around those dealing with EHR systems or other innovations. The increase in incentive payments for, from the federal government and from hospital incentive payments and uh, changes in the industry are demanding that more professionals are more aware of technology both from an installation perspective, software perspective, infrastructure, network security, and analytics. There are four primary stakeholders within the uh, domain. We'll be talking about the patients, the providers, the payers, and then the public at large, which is we consider the government. What role does technology play? The primary reason that a lot of people focus on technology is because there is a significant belief that the technology will reduce costs and increase quality. Whether that's true or not is actually irrelevant for the purposes of this discussion. That would be for a little bit later on. But what we, we know is that there is the general belief that we will be able to reduce costs by creating efficiencies within the system, reducing duplication, and we'll be able to uh, get better quality by re eliminating redundant tests or having information readily available. So those are the primary reasons why technology is considered to be a major player in the healthcare system. Uh, how does the evolving healthcare climate change? Well, all of the changes in regulation will really cause a significant, uh, significant turbulence in knowing what should be developed, what shouldn't be developed, uh, where it's going to be developed, who's going to do what, what do we need to integrate with, and what other information uh, is required. So by understanding the healthcare climate, understanding what's going on in the industry will allow technology professionals to better adapt to those changing needs. So let's take a quick walkthrough. Um, when an individual basically gets sick, they basically need to go to the doctor. Uh, what will happen is the patient will generally pay a copay uh, and the doctor will render service. What will then happen is, is the doctor or the provider will submit a claim to the insurance company. The insurance company will then receive the claim and either pay the claim or deny the claim. The amount of money that is uh, handled between the patient, between the provider and the insurance company are negotiated as rates of services as part of contracts, either a hospital contract or uh, provider contracts that are handled by the insurance company. As part of this whole uh, scheme, the patient will pay a regular premium either through their employer or separately to the insurance company. And all of this is overseen by the federal and state governments. It's important to know that they are, there are differences. Each state has their own regulatory body, and uh, the federal government is in play for much of it in terms of Medicare and uh, some rules on Medicaid, but the states will actually handle Medicaid themselves. Uh, each state has some additional rules and regulations with the Departments of Insurance, with uh, Departments of Health, and a lot of that needs to be coordinated, especially when you get into things like uh, management of chronic diseases or uh, infectious diseases where information needs to be sent to, say, the CDC. Uh, in addition, there are times when the federal government from the Department of Justice or Health and Human Services will require information both from hospitals, large hospital systems, or insurance companies. So who are the stakeholders? There are four primary stakeholders. The patients, who are the consumers of the health-related services, including diagnosis, treatment, pharmaceutical, lab results, uh, any of the like. Providers, these are the people who provide the health services. They could be your doctors, your hospitals, your labs. You'll hear the term DME, durable medical equipment uh, providers. Payers are third-party entities, insurance companies, and even the government to a degree. Uh, when we talk about the government, we're talking about the paying part, the Medicare, uh, even Medicaid parts. Uh, that pay for the health-related services on behalf of patients. And when we talk about the public, we're talking about government interests. We're referring to regulation and the exhibit of control on how those uh, service, on how services are rendered and paid. So what are some of the problems in the system? Well, the healthcare system delivers too much and too little care simultaneously. And what this basically means is that in some cases, it delivers too much care, and that may be an overabundance of caution, say, by a provider, who does not wish to be sued in a malpractice lawsuit, so they will issue another test. 
um, and too little care simultaneously is sometimes when the providers do not wish to uh, uh, provide a, uh, a service because they're not going to get paid for it or the service is denied by an insurance company, there's no authorization, so therefore uh, mandatory or required service cannot be performed. Providers get paid for services performed not healthy patients, and this is what we call fee-for-service. In, in our model right now, when you get sick, you go to the doctor, the doctor gets paid for that service. They do not get paid for healthy patients. So in order for providers to get paid, they need more sick people or sick people coming through the door. Uh, this model is changing a little bit, and there's been a lot of experimentation, and you'll see this a little bit later in what we'll call pay for performance. But right now it is what's called fee for service. Health plans make money insuring healthy people, not sick ones. This is a basic tenant of uh, financial insurance. So if you're familiar with insurance, you know that the risk is basically whether or not an, event, an adverse event will occur. If the adverse events do not occur, the insurance companies make money. So in this case, health plans will make money as long as they have more healthy people on the health rolls as opposed to sick people. In fact, one of the interesting statistics is that 50% of all of the costs in healthcare are consumed by approximately 5% of a population, either in an insurance company or in general. Medical treatments aren't necessarily known to make people better. Uh, this is a little bit of a, of a generalized statement, but what this means is that there are some treatments that are performed that are maybe 50% or 60% uh, success rate. Uh, and in some cases, it's even less than that. It just needs to be statistically significant in order for it to be um, valid. So, there, But there are so many confounds that occur with medical treatment that maybe it wasn't the drug or maybe it wasn't the treatment, it was something else. And in other cases, of course, it is the drug, but it isn't necessarily known which was the one. That's why there's a lot of research done and clinical trials that are constantly performed to verify the data. And finally, patients demand more care than they want to pay for. So an individual may say, I need an antibiotic or I need a, a bill, uh, I need a, a pill or I would like an MRI. So they want more care, but if they were asked to pay for it, they would not want to pay for that. Uh, it is because of the nature of the system that makes them demand stuff because there is no, not necessarily a high or at all direct uh, impact on the bottom line for the patient. So healthcare IT is basically believed uh, to be the solution to a lot of the problems, whereby uh, you can eliminate redundant tests, you can eliminate doctor visits, you can share information between providers. Uh, this sharing of information should lead to faster diagnosis and treatments. Uh, we should be able to reduce mundane tasks by automating things like billing and codification. Uh, the codification occurs on the claims bills, uh, on the claims that are sent to ensure that we have the right medical codes for diagnosis and treatment. In addition, we hope we can enable some self-service for appointments and prescription filling. And what that basically means is they don't write their own prescription, but they can refill, do automatic refills, uh, which we see today if you've ever had a prescription from, say, a CVS or a Walgreens or a Target. In addition, we can provide additional checks and balances between them by having a lot more data that can be analyzed to ensure that patients are receiving the right care and furthermore that the patients are receiving the care that they are supposed to receive and that it is having the effect that it's supposed to have. So some of the challenges, accepting and use of HIT by providers, patients, and payers. Uh, some of the technologies accepted, some of them isn't. Some of them aren't. So, for example, CIOs uh, have a, uh, are reluctant necessarily to implement mobile technologies because of the uncertainty in terms of the benefits of the uh, mobile technologies as opposed to the risk of privacy and security breaches. Uh, providers, a uh, significant number of providers, and we'll see this in the EHR section, EHR section uh, have a problem with uh, the implementation of EHR systems. Uh, because older providers don't necessarily see the benefit to doing that. And in fact, there is some data that shows that there is productivity loss. We need a lot more uh, educated, trained, technical professionals that understand the healthcare life cycle. Uh, there aren't that many. So you may have a, uh, a significant number of technologists, but they do not understand the healthcare domain. Uh, and conversely, there just isn't enough technical professionals out there to meet the demand. That is why there is such a, uh, a shortage of these uh, professionals who understand EHR and clinical informatics, as an example. The size of the networks and the amount of, da of data are enormous. As we collect more and more data, more and more lab results from many different uh, uh, focal points, uh, like blood, blood work, uh, blood pressure, weight, height, and many other uh, characteristics, as well as collecting images and sonograms, 
uh, MRIs, x-rays, and storing them as part of this longitudinal record of a patient's history, it becomes a massive challenge from a storage perspective and a retrieval perspective, as well as an analytical one. Uh, the existing technology that's in place in a lot of uh, hospitals and in payers, for example, is not very flexible. Uh, it, w these are some archaic systems uh, that require a lot of uh, manipulation and adaptation and to meet regulatory requirements as well as new, uh, new initiatives by hospitals and providers and payers. The age variance of utilization within the market, ability to keep of the technology to keep consumers satisfied is another challenge. So for example, older uh, patients may not be so open to uh, say having their records uh, electron on an electronic medium, whereas younger patients might not have that much of an issue because they grew up with the technology. So keeping consumers satisfied in the space is very difficult. So technology in healthcare is slower or lags behind other industries. Uses of the internet uh, is only now becoming a little bit more prolific, whereas in retail and financial it's been much more prolific. Marketing branding of these IT solutions uh, for consumers is definitely lagging behind. The back, a lot of back-end systems still use older technologies such as COBOL, uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that when we get to the EHR section as well. Um, the cornerstone of HIT has been the use of electronic data interchange, e EDI. This has allowed payers and the government and, insurance, uh, and hospitals and providers to submit data and claims using a standardized format, making it easier for systems to integrate. And so this has been one of the key things, and it's been, uh, it was an initiative around 1996 and has been pretty much in play and part of the entire domain since officially around 2004-2003. Pharmacy outlets have been extremely aggressive in promoting healthcare technology for the uh, examination of prescriptions that come in for a patient. They look for adverse events and they look for ways to make the consumer much more safer with regards to the prescriptions they have. These are outlets whose goal is to get consumers into their retail outlets. So providing this information to the patients is a critical part of keeping those customers happy they would be the leaders and the pioneers in the healthcare space of using technology to their advantage. Having a mobile app for your pharmacy prescriptions is an extremely useful tool and they do it very well. And consumers are educating themselves to become more active participants in the market and we'll see this with the uh, increase in use of what are called personal health records where the individual is able to uh, keep their records online from an aggregate number of sources as well as maintain things like height, weight, exercise routines. They're also going online to get information from places like WebMD so they can kind of perform some self-diagnosis before they go into a doctor's office. The benefits of that are subject to concern for some doctors, but it is how consumers are reacting to the changing dynamics of the industry. So where are some of the costs in the healthcare system? Uh, this is actually comes from the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, uh, the Office of the Actuary around 2009. It's a little bit outdated, but it still holds. Hospital care is about 31%, physician and clinical services about 21%. So you're looking at about 52% of all of the costs going into direct costs for care. If you include another 10% for retail drugs, uh, you're at 62%. So six, literally two-thirds of the entire uh, healthcare domain costs are really in the ability uh, or in the ability of providers to provide their services, either through pills or through the hospital care as an inpatient or through physicians and clinical services. The other uh, areas are a little bit smaller and the goal is to target health information technology in each of the areas so that we can get significant cost reductions. So communication, everybody comes from a different section of the healthcare industry if you're taking this course. Some of you may be nurses, some of you may not have any healthcare experience at all. But the key is that the understandings and perspectives are not always the same. So what is important to a doctor is not the same as what's important to a nurse, which is not the same as what's important to an administrator, which may be completely different to a patient or to a payer. The needs of the stakeholders are sometimes at odds. We would like to think that the whole goal is to have the patient care at the highest level quality, but the reality is, is that there are a significant amount of pressures on providing quality services and trying to reduce costs at the same time, which impact overall decisions. 
So some of the standard technologies that we'll talk about at certain points throughout the course are just in general medical systems, clinical systems that are used, such as uh, you know the clinical systems for uh, x-ray machines, MRIs, uh, blood pressure machines, uh, BMI calculators, any one of those things that will collect some information about the patient's record. The electronic medical record versus the electronic health record, we will talk about the differences between the two. Uh, we're going to basically stick to the EHR as being the core terminology that we will use. We'll talk about back office systems for appointments and billing. We'll also talk about EDI, electronic data interchange, uh, the 837, 835, 277, 278 documents. These will all become uh, much more uh, clear to you as we get to that section. We'll talk about clearing houses and gateways for claims. Uh, we'll briefly talk about claims adjudication systems uh, for insurance companies, web technologies that are used by a variety of stakeholders. We'll have a section on data collection and analysis, a brief one on data warehousing. There's a full course on the certificate program on that. How we do regulatory reporting, what types of other web technologies are used in terms of, of uh, regulatory reporting, some future technologies, and we'll get a little bit more into data warehouses and business intelligence systems. These are some other terms that are probably good for you to just get familiar with. We won't go through all of these, but you can find these online as well. And depending on the course that you take or the area that you're interested in, you'll be able to um, find each of these and, and learn them. We'll go through probably about 70% of these. Thank you, and we'll see you for Module 2.